Hello, Year 12s. I hope your holidays have been a little relaxing so far and also a little bit productive. Let's get straight into the next couple of prompts. Okay, so out of winter and enunciations, we're going to do together uh, because they're both poems uh, in response to the same theme. If you remember last time that uh, her last collection were published shortly after the death of her first child, a few years after she was born, Alexandra, her name was. These poems were written in response to that. Her earlier poems perhaps were the work of an artist looking for something to say and not quite sure how to say it. Certainly she was enjoying uh, writing poetry, learning about ancient myths, playing with form, uh, doing different things. But this poem is different. This marks a bit of a turning point for Dobson. It's a response to a very real moment in her own life, the, the death of her daughter soon after birth. So it's a reflection of her experience and on her experience uh, of this heart-wrenching moment for her. So as we go through, think about the ways that these two poems are different from the ones that we've read so far. As usual, we'll do a reading first. Uh, try and get everything you can out of it. Maybe pause it, <clears throat> underline any parts that you're not sure about, uh, write notes on anything you are sure about, and then listen to my analysis after you've done your first reading. So, out of winter. Darkness shaken by the wind. Winter, beating the tree of darkness gathers. The windfall stars, a natural harvest. Bright bitter fruit, colder than water. Out of darkness, I ask for solace. The clean, the truthful lines of winter. And time has shaken my mind, reaping the fruit of pain, the fruit of grieving. I ask the anatomy of beginnings, landscapes, bared to the bones of rocks and boulders, the simple truths of early paintings, births, deaths, and belief in visions. Water contents me in the sky at evening, the promise of flowers in the air at noonday. Schooled in the miracles of Fra Angelico, I await the angel of the Annunciation. Fair tree, bare mind, swept clean of anguish. Accept simplicities, be patient. Await the bird in the bough, the tremor of life in the veins, another springtime. Okay, so if you haven't paused it already, pause it and uh, do your own short first reading analysis. At least think what is the main point of each stanza before moving on. Okay, so let's look at stanza one, out of winter. So, darkness shaken by the wind, winter, beating the tree of darkness gathers, the windfall stars and natural harvest, bright, bitter fruit, colder than water. So the first thing to notice is that we're opening in winter, the wind is beating a tree, the tree of darkness gathers, Darkness gathers the windfall stars. So winter is gathering the windfall stars. Let's uh, notice that windfall is when apple or fruit is shaken loose by the wind. So it's a sort of harvesting. Uh, in this case, it's an unnatural harvest, a too early harvest. So it's harvesting fruit in winter. Uh, the fruit is bitter. It's not ripe yet. And also it doesn't normally grow at this time. So the fruit to the taste is bitter and it's cold, cold like winter. Uh, how does each element of this contribute to this metaphor that is building throughout this poem, this metaphor of winter or of death? Uh, some symbols here that you'll want to notice. Darkness, what does darkness represent? Winter and the seasons more generally are pretty prevalent throughout these next, this poem and the next one. Uh, fruit, the idea of fruit, the idea of ripeness, uh, the idea of fruit falling before its time. Shaking, uh, sh the tree shaken, darkness shaken, Dobson perhaps shaken. Stars, uh, what do stars represent? We'll leave that as a open question. And finally, water is again here in this poem. We'll leave that pretty open as well. You should have an idea of what, of winter representing uh, death or grief. The same with darkness and of course the bitter fruit or the unripe fruit falling out of time uh, before its time 
is Dobson's child. Okay, let's notice the form. So the poem is in free verse. Uh, there's no particular rhyme scheme. Each line does have four beats, except there are two cases of enjambment throughout. So winter in line one of stanza one and landscapes in line one of stanza three are uh, enjambment. So there's uh, the words continue over the, over the line, over from line one to two in both cases. You, you want to think about, as we always think about with form, what is the effect that the enjambment has? Does the enjambment in this case stop us out of rhythm to emphasize something? What does it draw attention to? Okay, a quick recap. Consonants is uh, repeated vowel sounds. Assonance uh, is when there are repeated, sorry, consonants is repeated consonant sounds, of course. Assonance is repeated vowel sounds. And alliteration is consonants at the start of multiple words close together, that should say. Uh, if you like, you can click on this Khan Academy link that I have put here. Uh, if you're viewing this in the mix online, if this is just a video, you can just search Alliteration Khan Academy and you can go there. So before you say, oh, I hate talking about alliteration or consonants, it's never there, blah, 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 blah. Well, in this one, it's really obvious. So notice the two distinct A sounds, so R and A, paired throughout this whole stanza. So darkness shaken, darkness shaken by the wind. Winter, maybe as we'll go through, we'll put some other highlights in there as well. Winter, beating the tree of darkness gathers. Darkness gathers. The wind falls, stars. The unnatural harvest, bright bitter fruit, colder than water. Now, we've got the A and the R sound, even at the end, than water. We don't need the R for the water. A sound. What is the effect of this on the reader? There's, it's here so much throughout this stanza. Darkness shaken, darkness gathers. The wind falls, stars, and natural harvest colder than water. What is the effect of all of that on the reader? Particularly, maybe, where is the pattern not followed? Uh, what patterns are there where it isn't followed, perhaps? Where is there, where is there other alliteration throughout this stanza? Uh, and what is the effect of that? I want you to think about that carefully. So hopefully that uh, question input box worked okay for you and you're able to submit an answer. That's good. We'll be able to go through them in class hopefully later. For now, let's move on. So we're turning to the personal now with uh, stanza three. Out of darkness, sorry, stanza two. Out of darkness, I ask for solace, the clean, the truthful lines of winter. And time has shaken my mind, reaping the fruit of pain, the fruit of grieving. Solace is, solace is peace. It's a, a very prevalent theme throughout these two poems. So how might the clean, truthful lines of winter represent peace for Dobson? This is a real change from stanza one. Stanza one winter was death. Darkness was death. Uh, it was an unnatural harvest. It was nothing was right with it but in this case winter is seen as something clean something truthful uh, looking at this phrase out of darkness at the start coming out from moving out moving beyond what is the title of this poem out of winter uh, what does that perhaps signal that dobson is meaning this poem to focus on uh, so to reap is to harvest or gather so we normally talk about that in terms of fruit, but also in terms of a soul, which uh, perhaps fruit represents as well in this case. And time has shaken my mind, reaping the fruit of pain, the fruit of grieving. So somehow there's been some sort of fruit of pain, some sort of fruit of grieving. Time has shaken my mind. Time, big T. What, what do you think time means for Dobson? 
We'll have to have a chat about that in class, but you should be thinking about how time is used in other poems and how it might mean something similar or different in this one. Okay, stanza three. Time has shaken Dobson's mind, reaping the fruit of pain, the fruit of grieving. Something's happened to her mind. She's reaping some sort of uh, reward or coming away from this experience, the experience of losing a child, is some sort of consequence. So let's have a look at that in stanza three. I ask the anatomy of beginnings, landscapes, bared to the bones of rocks and boulders, simple truths of early paintings, births, deaths, and belief in visions. Where is Dobson's mind turning here? How is this quite different to her earlier poetry? Uh, what is her mind turning to? It's not turning to complicated, it's not turning to complexity, it's not turning to grand myths or fun stories. Mind has been uh, swept clean of extravagance, like a landscape, a landscape perhaps swept clean of forests and buildings till only the, the bones of rocks and boulders remain. Maybe like a landscape painting without ornamentation or complexity. So her mind is considering now the, the elemental blocks of life of existence, uh, perhaps meaning. Going back to the simple truths, the clean lines of winter, births, deaths, and belief in visions. Now we'd be remiss to not draw our attention again to the alliteration. It's very present in stanza three, so how does the alliteration carry the message of the poem? You should be thinking about this and of course as we go through all these videos thinking about how everything we tell you and how everything we ask you to think about can be used in your writing so how would you write about the alliteration in stanza three if we ask you to do so okay water contents me and the sky at evening the promise of flowers in the air at noonday. Schooled in the miracles of Fra Angelico, I await the angel of Annunciation. Okay, the simple truths are comforting. Water, water not ice, so flowing water contents Dobson. Why, why does water, thinking about how water is used in other poems, why would that contempt Dobson? What does it represent? What's the promise of flowers? Uh, if we're thinking about this as a metaphor of seasons, of time and water, what is the promise of flowers, the promise of spring in the air at noonday? How could that be a metaphor for her experience of losing a child? Okay, schooled in the miracles of Fra Angelico, I await the angel of the Annunciation. Uh, hopefully you've looked at the resources I posted on Compass a little while ago now. Uh, the Annunciation was a painting We'll have a look at it in a second. It was a painting notable for its sparseness, its simplicity, and its outdoor location. So normally, uh, the Annunciation, that's the announcement of Jesus' conception to Mary, uh, to Mary, his mother. So in this case, it's the announcement of new life. Dobson is awaiting spring. Let's have a look at the uh, painting. So you can see this painting is quite... Uh, sparse and bare there's not much furniture except a seat often Mary would be pictured holding a Bible or inside uh, and she'd normally look surprised the angel of Annunciation is uh, Gabriel Gabriel announced the birth of Jesus to Mary uh, it's a really really nice painting uh, and I'm sure Dobson would have found comfort in something like this. We should notice, of course, that it's it's sparse, it's simple, and it's outdoors. Uh, both elements, not only of this painting, but of this poem. So, Dobson is awaiting spring. The last stanza, summing up the mental journey of the poem. So, bare tree, bare mind, swept clean of anguish, accept simplicities, be patient. Await the bird in the bough, the tremor of life in the veins, another springtime. Hopefully you've understood that the poem is moving towards from out of winter 
towards spring. So this this last stanza sums up uh, her journey, her journey through winter. So bare tree, bare mind, swept clean of anguish. There's been a, a cleansing in the grieving process, uh, cleansing coming out of winter. Accept simplicities, be patient. Each line has four beats, uh, and this line is no different. But there are only, as there are only four words, we're forced to space each one out. So accept simplicities, be patient. That, that takes time. Be patient. How does that uh, emphasize the meaning of the words there? Await the bird in the bow, the tremor of life in the veins. Another springtime. So looking forward from this towards spring, perhaps to another child. Okay, poem number two, Annunciations. So upon reflecting on the same experience, but this one very much grounded in her Catholic faith. Uh, let's have a look at it. So same as before, have a read through with me yourself, uh, make some notes, figure out what you can from it first, find out things that are probably different to what I'm going to tell you. Possibly they're really valuable and you wouldn't get them if you just think about it the way I think about it. So make notes for yourself first on the first read through with me and then go on for my commentary. Okay, Annunciations. All my past years were waiting years, the time to fashion out of flesh and blood and one drop of fire, the promised and the prophesied. Beating wings were stilled, the word of advent lay upon my mouth. Lulled by the drumming of my blood, the distant thunder of my heart, you slept upon the moving tide of darkness sealed in mortal flesh. Once more immortal wings were stilled, I heard the word that bade you come. The farthest galaxies recede beyond the reach of human sight, as starry rivers to that sea, unbounded, shoreless, infinite. From whence we come, to which we go. In the beginning was the word. Child, children, though I hold you here, a moment to my mortal heart, you go from me as rivers go, as stars move to their destined place. The beating wings are clamorous. I hear the word. I let you go. This is a, a really beautiful uh, poem, a really calm, serene, peaceful reflection of Dobson's. Uh, so let's get into it. Okay, motherhood is praised throughout uh, this poem, very much valorized. So all my past years were waiting years for time to fashion out of flesh. Uh, waiting years, she's waiting to become a mother. Fashion out of flesh, uh, many phrases in this poem are biblical. Fashion out of flesh is refers and connects to divine action, in this case creation, as God created humans. Uh, many moments in this poem will connect everyday things, ordinary things like pregnancy or uh, uh, ourselves or our birth or our soul. We will connect it with our ordinary experience with the divine. This is about, this is about the prevalence of Dobson's faith in her life. The promise and the prophesied I uh, would usually refer to Jesus as the saviour or the messiah of mankind. Uh, in this case, it refers to all children. Uh, the beating wings were stilled, uh, possibly refers to the soul, the soul as if it's an angel, or in this case, uh, the beating wings were stilled, so the wings of the child were stilled. Beating, obviously, could also be, mean heart. Um, which unfortunately was stilled as well. Advent is a time of waiting, or the time before the arrival. So the Advent, the period of Advent is before uh, leading up to Christmas. There's a season of Advent. Uh, you might know them from the chocolate calendars that they give out. So the word of Advent lay upon my mouth. She's she's waiting. She's waiting for the the announcement of her child.
Okay, lulled by the drumming of my blood, the distant thunder of my heart, you slept upon the moving tide of darkness sealed in mortal flesh. Once more immortal wings were stilled, I heard the word that bade you come. So for time to fashion out of flesh, sorry, we'll go back for a second. Uh, she's pregnant and the baby is growing. The baby is made from blood and a drop of fire, perhaps divine, a divine spark. Uh, we have the the connection with the divine in beating wings and we're waiting for the birth. So lulled by the drumming of my blood, the distant thunder of my heart, you slept upon the moving tide of darkness sealed in mortal flesh. It's a really lovely image of uh, the baby in the womb, uh, growing, waiting to be born. Once more, immortal wings were stilled. I heard the word that bade you come. And the word doesn't just refer to uh, a word, but can also refer to God himself, God as the word. Uh, sometimes God is called the word. We'll get more into that in standard three. In this case, uh, calling calling Alexandra, uh, the growing fetus, back to him. Okay. The farthest galaxies recede beyond the reach of human sight. As starry rivers to that sea, unbounded, shoreless, infinite, from whence we come to which we go. So this is the infinite, the infinite beyonds, deeply connected with the divine. So Dobson is identifying God with uh, the infinite, unbounded, shoreless sea of the universe. Starry rivers to that sea. Starry rivers, uh, you could think of like the Milky Way being a river through the galaxy, but also possibly referencing a sea of souls moving back to God. So souls coming from God and then moving back to God, coming into flesh, uh, sealed in flesh, and then going back out, out of flesh to God. Okay, in the beginning was the word, this last line of stanza three. Uh, that's a very recognisable verse from the Bible. It's from the Gospel of John, I think. Uh, it describes the creation of the universe, but it begins with this line, um, which is referring to God's, immor no, not immortality, but eternal, eternal existence. Um, so God is the word. So it's saying, in the beginning there was God. Uh, and God is from whence we come to which we go. So Dobson is saying that her child, Alexandra's soul will return, come, has come from God and will return to God. And that's again reiterated in this last stanza. Child, children, though I hold you here, a moment to my mortal heart, you go from me as rivers go, as stars move to their destined place. So my mortal heart, the implication could be that her soul's love for her child is immortal or everlasting. Uh, water is again used as a metaphor here. So again, how is this uh, usage of water as a, of a river moving similar or different to Dobson's other in, uh, instances? Water is a really prevalent symbol used through a lot of her poems, and you're going to need to write on it at some point. So have a think about how it's used similarly or differently here. Uh, how, does, how does her child go from her as rivers go? What is it to do with flowing or passing or moving that rivers do? So as stars move to their destined place, the beating wings are clamorous. I hear the word. I let you go. These are, again, really, really lovely lines, these last three. <coughs> Uh, summing up and giving a real sense of closure to the poem and to Dobson's uh, reflection on this experience. So as stars move to their destined place, the uh, Alexandra, her soul moves back to God. The beating wings are clamorous. The souls of not just her child, but many children moving back to God, the beating wings. I hear the word. Uh, she hears God. I let you go. It'd be quite a big thing to let a child a child go mentally, go through the grieving process, and then finally let your child go. So 
this is quite uh, quite the realization to come to at the end here. Uh, she's found peace in releasing her child to God. It's a really beautiful image. Okay, so uh, there's one final question for you to do after this. Hopefully you found this useful. We are going to be putting out uh, about a poem or two every day from now on. Uh, so good luck. Send us an email if you'd like any help or uh, you want to make any comments. And we'll talk to you in the next one.